name is Tom Del. Uh, and I'm at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Canada. I'd like to welcome you all today to our next virtual session of the Environmental Peace Building Associations Conference. Our session today is on water conflict and peace. And we have four great panelists, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from each one of them, who are going to discuss different aspects of this issue. I'm going to first introduce each of our panelists. And then uh, we will go through and have short presentations by each uh, according to the order in the program. And then we will have at least 30 minutes at the end for question and answer. And I welcome all questions either in the chat or you're welcome to uh, raise a hand and ask your question directly. So let, uh, let me first introduce all of the panelists in the order that they appear on the screen uh, on your program. First, I'd like to welcome Anuradha Jangra. Anuradha is a doctoral candidate at the Center for West Asian Security, Jawaharlal uh, Nehru University in New Delhi, India. Anuradha's doctoral research focuses on river water sharing in Iraq, examining through a federalism perspective with a case study of the Kurdish regional government. Her interests are Kurdish society and politics, non-traditional security, and India's engagement with the region. Welcome, Anuranda. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Yunus Ozturk. Uh, Dr. Yunus Ozturk is a lecturer, doctor in international relations at the Recep Tayyip Erdogan University in Riza, Turkey, and is also a non-resident fellow in the African Foundation in Ankara, Turkey. Dr. Ozturk completed his PhD in political science and international relations at the University of Delaware. Uh, Dr. Ozturk's research areas include international security, political violence, civil wars, environmental security, MENA, and the Horn of Africa. Dr. Ozturk is currently working on the impact of foreign aid, including humanitarian aid, and natural resource extraction on civil war dynamics and the Gulf states' foreign relations towards the Horn of Africa. Welcome, Eunice. Next, I'd like to introduce both Paria Mamasani and Hossein Farzan, who are going to be presenting a uh, video uh, presentation because their connection is a little uh, uncertain. Uh, Paria recently completed her master's degree in water resources management and planning from Tarbiat Modaris University. Paria's research interests are conflict analysis, conflict transformation, hydropolitics, and water diplomacy water diplomacy, excuse me. Currently, Paria is conducting research on the role of, of effective factors contributing to the national water conflict in the Zyanderud River Basin. Hope I said that correctly. Welcome, Paria. Joining Paria in the presentation today is Hossein Farzin. Hossein is currently pursuing a master's degree in water resources management and planning from Tarbiat Modaris University in Tehran. Hussein's research interests lie within the field of water and international relations, with a specific focus on hydropolitics and water diplomacy, water and environmental security, and analysis of water and environmental pol policies. Hussein's master's thesis examines the role of soft power in the hydropolitical relations of the transboundary river basin, uh, with the Hirmad transboundary river basin serving as a case study. Welcome, Hussein. And lastly, but of course not least, is Dr. Rajat Banerjee. Uh, Dr. Banerjee is an associate professor of law in the Alliance School of Law at Alliance University in Bengaluru, India. He did his PhD at the West Bengal National University of Jud Juridical Sciences. His areas of research include environmental law, comparative constitutional law, public law and policy, intellectual property rights, human rights law, and law and technology. Dr. Banerjee is currently working on the intersection between climate change and human rights with a special focus on the UN SDGs. Uh, welcome, Dr. Banerjee. Thank you, everybody. And now I'd like to turn it over to Anuradha, who will begin our presentation. Go ahead, Anuradha. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Am I audible? So, uh, uh, good evening, everyone. My topic is uh, Women Water Diplomat, a case study of the Nile River Basin in water diplomacy. 
So diplomacy and the negotiation or have been studied historically and these profession are dominated by men. So, but in recent years, there is an increasing involvement of women in diplomatic uh, endeavors, particularly if we look at that the peace building and the international negotiations. So within the diplomacy aspect, there is a sub-discipline that is water. So while women's role in diplomacy has received considerable attention uh, in academic and uh, uh, policy papers, but the role of women, dip, uh, the role of women in uh, like uh, in critical uh, um, area like uh, water or climate actions or water sharing arrangements are unexplored. So I am looking at the Nile River in that context. So in last one decade, the so basically, what is water diplomacy? So water diplomacy, which deals with the political nature of water governance at transboundary level, has increasingly received attention in both uh, research and policy paper. But uh, the first question arises that how uh, water diplomacy is different from the traditional way of water, uh, traditional way of negotiating water arrangements or water cooperation. So. Uh, so basically, water diplomacy is a uh, it involves a broad range of broad broad range of uh, stakeholders, emphasizing long term planning, integrate uh, science with diplo into policy, and prioritize equity with inclusive uh, decision making process. Uh, it's not a uh, state centric. It includes a lot of stakeholders in that. So there. Uh, that's where I'll this paper look at the role of women in water diplomacy, where I'm using Nile River uh, based in a case study. So if you look at the Nile uh, Nile River, so it's one of the complex and multifaceted issues in the uh, in the West Asian or the Middle East region. And uh, the current status quo, uh, like there is no the, the the current status quo has been impacted by the colonial legacy uh, of the region. So the river, as we know, the river span multiple countries, almost eleven I think eleven countries, uh, each with its own interests, challenges, and priorities regarding water resource management. This reason or these countries do not share a common language or religion or history. And the reason has, uh, uh, like, in terms of trade also, it's not that much connected. And the reason also has, the, in terms of, we look at the political stability. So until late uh, 20th century, there was a instability in that uh, area also. So... The basin has been beset by a general distrust uh, as a legacy, whereas asymmetrical uh, development uh, and water utilization among upstreams and lower stream states, you can uh, see that. So uh, in that, uh, I'll look at two. One is governmental uh, or governmental uh, structure, which is the interstate governmental structure. And the second part, I'm looking at the uh, non-governmental uh, organization initiative. So first one is uh, this uh, called Nile Basin Initiative. It started in 1990s, and it is uh, only basin-wide uh, decision-making institute, uh, where it's basically an in stream intergovernmental organization with a membership of 10 out of 11 basin states. So it focus on multiple multilateral dialogues, information sharing, joint planning or management and development of the resources in the Nile Basin. So it support the member states is, uh, in, in terms of analysis, policy development or uh, uh, in terms of investment projects. Uh, if you look at that uh, historically, uh, this uh, the the negotiation process have been dominated by male diplomats, so reflecting broader gender disparity within the field of diplomacy. So the struct, if you look at the structure, though there are three main uh, uh, element to it. One first is the Nile Secretariat, the second is the Nile Council of Ministers. Is a high the Nile Council of Ministers uh, ministry is the highest decision making body, so it's responsible for water in the basin state. And if you look at the latest data in 2023, according to the uh, according to that, there were three women uh, represented uh, representative out of ten uh, ministers. And the third is the the third is the technical advisory committee, which is the advisory and a supportive body of the which is 
provide advice with provide uh, assistance to the nile council of ministry which i mentioned earlier so it provide it it uh, provide in terms of policy direction and strategic guidance so in this uh, committee there are two representative from each state which are basically mostly are dominated by men but there are a few policies that these countries are adopting where they are sending uh, at least one of the member should be a female representative and if you look at that the chair of this committee so there were two the two chair were uh, from these countries also two chair were a uh, female uh, 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 the country uh, from R kenya and rwanda so in the the the, if you look at that, uh, the uh, like gender equality situation across the Nile River Basin countries, though in itself uh, the political participation of women is in question. So with that, uh, some countries are like the the if you look at that their uh, position. Uh, so some countries are better off in compared to others. So it uh. It, it is a hierarchical decision making uh, culture where uh, uh, basically the member uh, follow strict guidelines and the, the other network other initiative that i looked at was the women and water diplomacy network so for all these uh, so it's a it's not a governmental uh, committee it's basically started by it's a parallel uh, initiative uh, where then uh, to which talk about which uh, provide uh, uh, which provide capacity building to the women voices from the Nile River Basin. So it provide the uh, so basically negotiation that there is we we heard this term the art of negotiation. So women have faced problem because they are not part of this uh, uh, institution. So they don't know how to. Uh, like negotiate and all these things. So these inst these organization uh, provide them uh, the training in that regard. So it's a, it's a basically a professional network where it's offer support training, uh, which uh, and it also bring women from different uh, countries. Uh, women negotiator who already part of the ministry at different level it doesn't mean that uh, they can uh, it at a various level and it also help them to improve their career uh, like uh, if you look at this uh, this uh, initiative so there is they have this two uh, process of recruitments where they look at the active and passive recruitment so they make con in the active recruitments they make contact with the ministries and the passive level uh, connect in the passive passive level recruitment they connect the women from the different countries through offline and online workshop so uh, so ministry of foreign affairs uh, so for, uh, sudan ministry of foreign affairs ambassador nadia gefon in one of the workshops said uh, during the renesa dam negotiation so there were five women uh, from three different uh, delegations uh, so all these women has one thing in common and that was this network uh, the women and water diplomacy network so in that in a parallel universe this network is bringing all these women who uh, who can negotiate or who can bring uh, more uh, who can bring a different perspective and it provide a platform a separate pl platform to these women so uh, for this uh, the met if you look at the methodological aspects so i interviews um, uh, six uh, people from the region the interview conducted were online and uh, some of them uh, like uh, some of I couldn't hear some of the responses but uh, and I also interviewed two people from uh, a different river basin uh, one is uh, in Brahmaputra river where a woman is part of the Brahmaputra river negotiation so I wanted to understand the differences and challenges so if we look at the challenges what kind of challenges women face in this male dominated area so despite their contribute or despite their different understanding or or they are the one who affected uh, by this water scarcity most women face significant barriers in water diplomacy including gender stereotypes limited access to decision making forums or unequal power dynamics so there were three uh, major like identical which uh, everyone uh, uh, 
like everyone said uh, everyone identified one was the cultural belief and all so in like this reason is particularly known for um, like uh, if if we look at that gender gender debate in this region so it it's a one of the interesting aspect of it so if uh, so men as a decision maker and uh, diplomats are uh, like uh, they are the dominant one or it's hard that they that's why it's a hard for a woman to make a voice in decision even when they are present and uh, the second is that inequalities in educational opportunities specifically if you look at the science uh, uh, science education so it's it's the same problem in india also uh, like uh, it's a particularly driven by stereotypes where women are not like uh, it's uh, women are not pursuing science based uh, uh professions because if you look at that water it's some aspect of the water um it's deal with the engineering and sciences background but women are not part of all these educational opportunities so because of that uh, a good chunk of women cannot be part of all these uh, cannot uh, cannot be part of the, all these uh, negotiation or they can provide their views and the third is the gap in legal and in the institutional framework so women are continue to be under present in all levels of institutional decision making uh, if, if when it comes uh, in in the national level women are like the women specific policies are being introduced but if we look at the trans boundary uh, rivers so women still are lacking in that area so we can see the workplace discrimination also one of the water diplomat told me a pitch uh, told me a scenario where uh, she was sitting alone in a room where all men were there so it was a very she says like he, i face like for instance if i want to uh, uh, say something or if this whole this uh, workplace uh, uh, environment is different for a men and women because men can stay after the official hours but women can't do that they have to run for their houses they have to do other work also so in that case uh, women uh, can't like these are the no, places no, one, one minute left thank you okay this is these are the cases where women can these are the cases where uh, anyone can build uh, connections so this is a case where women are uh, women can't go beyond that so this one um, author lon lavos lasso he argues that the gender are addressed in interstate water politics but it is at the request of the donors not from the state itself uh, in the on the question of interaction between men and women and leadership role so there was this uh, uh, understanding that women in at the decision making table would be uh, like more like they willing to more uh, inclined to listen like inclined to be uh, soft or uh, they want to listen more or they want to understand the different different perspective on the leadership part so how could it affect the negotiation that the uh, transboundary level the assumptions were that women would be more willing sorry this is the same uh, willing to listen to the other side and to understand in conclusion i would say that there like i face problem in terms of finding the numbers because at the different level i couldn't find men in uh, like uh, the number of women who are working but there are like more women i can say that there are more women in water diplomacy in compared to last three decades when the uh, this negotiation process started uh, but women are still underrepresented and the vast majority of the women working at the ministry of water or equivalent in the nile basin uh, they have administrative and secretarial positions uh, and thus the perspective of women not included in the decision making uh, do they 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 are part of those negotiations but uh, still those uh, like their perspectives or the or, or their views are not part of those negotiations because they are at a different level of those uh, uh, governmental structure thank, thank you. you thank you thank you anuranda sorry yunus over to you all right um Can you see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, great. Oh, you can, yes. So, uh, if you could just uh, maximize it. 
Uh, just give me a second. Mm. What about this? Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, Welcome to our panel. I'm Yunus, a lecturer, Dr. Recep Tayyip Erdogan University. Today, I will present my dissertation project, which is about the nexus between persistent roads and civil war dynamics. As you know, since 1945, the world has been experiencing two notable and simultaneous conflict trends. Interstate wars have become a rare phenomenon, particularly in the developed world. On the other hand, civil wars have become much more prevalent in the developing world. Although some scholars stress that weak state, illegitimate governments, problematic national identities, and territorial disputes are all related to why the world has been experiencing an increasing number of interstate wars in the developing world, I argue that their arguments miss some of the notable features of these emerging wars. Compared to the past, these wars show distinct and various violence trends in terms of intensity, duration, termination, external interventions, and the number of civilian deaths and displaced people. For instance, these civil wars have become much more prolonged and less conducive to ending with a decisive military victory. Although civil wars are considered to be the new normal of the post-Cold War international order, the reason for such an increasing number of interstate wars is not related to their onsets, but their decreasing level of terminations. In general, I wonder what factors are likely to explain the increased prevalence of prolonged civil wars in the developing world. I mean, what factors help us to understand why some countries in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East have remained plagued by protracted civil wars, whereas others have been able to overcome these substantial levels of domestic unrest more quickly. As you may know, the incidence and severity of anthropogenic climate change related hazards have increased globally in the last 50 years. Their adverse effects are most felt among socially and economically marginalized groups in the developing world. Such environmental hazards lead to food insecurity, the disruption of social services, the loss of livelihoods, the decline in well-being, and involuntary migrations, mainly among vulnerable groups. Given the interactions between environmental problems and social, economic, and political issues, particularly interstate conflicts, the goal of my research was to explore whether environmental problems particularly water insecurity, are one of the essential factors contributing to the dynamics of civil wars. In seeking answers to these research questions, I have built my theoretical model based on the human security concept. Compared to the traditional security perspective, the human security concept examines the impact of both military and non-military threats on the well-being and welfare of individuals and social groups in addition to state security. To develop my theoretical model, I conducted a comprehensive literature review of civil war dynamics and environmental security. First, I examined what factors civil war scholars look at to understand the dynamics of civil wars. In the second part of my literature review, I deal with the arguments on environmental security. Here, I aim to discover how civil war scholars consider environmental issues in explaining armed conflicts. According to my theoretical model, civil war outcomes depend on warring parties' strategic calculations about whether to continue or exit the war. In other words, the outcome of civil wars or the decision of warring parties indicates the duration of civil wars, as civil war outcomes are interconnected with civil war durations. So, I argue that water insecurity affects civil war durations and outcomes in two ways, by undermining people's livelihoods and by decreasing the state's capacity. Heightened grievances, the low state capacity in this feasible environment for rebellion, the low opportunity cost of participation, and thereby drought-induced changes in relative power, 
forced warring parties to change their strategic calculations about continuing or ending the war. But I also argue that the three conditional factors play a central role in this causal mechanism, an agricultural-based economic structure, the number of non-state actors, and discriminatory and exclusionary state policies. To test whether my theoretical model is supported by internally and externally validated evidence, I pursued a sequential mixed method research strategy. The first part of my dissertation project mainly focuses on the impact of moderator variables on the water insecurity civil war dynamics nexus in order to understand how the interaction between droughts and the conditional factors impacts civil war dynamics. So I developed eight hypotheses that can be categorized according to the moderator variables. To test my hypothesis, I used the competing risk survival model to evaluate how water insecurity proxied by the roads can simultaneously impact the durations and outcomes of civil wars. I thought that civil war dynamics could be an appropriate theme for the competing risk survival model, since any civil war can end with only one of more than two outcomes, a negotiated settlement, a rebel victory, or a government victory. As you may know, competing risks occur when there are at least two possible outcomes that a subject uh, can experience. I found that persistent roads in an ongoing civil war decrease the duration of civil wars to end with a government victory, but predominantly with a negotiated settlement. Second, I found partial empirical evidence that persistent droughts in agricultural-based economies prolong civil wars, but this impact is limited to government victories. Third, in general, persistent droughts significantly prolong civil wars, having multiple rebel groups, but decreasing the influence of both government and rebel victories. Last but not least, in the existence of politically excluded social groups and in countries with greater economic discrimination against particular social groups. Persistent roads do not significantly affect either the duration or outcome of civil wars. The second part of my dissertation mainly focuses on the mediator variables in order to understand how and through what ways persistent roads impact civil war duration and outcomes. So based on my theoretical model, I developed four propositions that can be listed in the order of causal chain. To validate my propositions through a process tracing method, I mainly investigated the daily reports of the Forum Broadcast Information Service. For case selection, I selected my cases only if both dependent and independent variables coexist in a given case. To avoid case selection bias to some extent, I categorize cases in a way that both my dependent and independent variables have some variation in their durations. In this regard, I created a bivariate table in which both roads and civil wars are categorized according to their durations. I mean, short versus long. To understand the causal mechanisms, I employed a minimalist process tracing method. For case selection rationale, child is the most likely case of my dissertation project in which the causal mechanism can be easily identified as Chad experienced one of the most persistent droughts and prolonged civil wars in the post-Second World War period. Sudan, on the other hand, is the equifinality case of my dissertation project by which I aim to find at least one alternative causal mechanism since Sudan experienced a prolonged civil war despite having a short-lived drought period. Last, Ethiopia uh, is the falsification case of my dissertation, as Ethiopia experienced a persistent drought, but not a prolonged civil war simultaneously. This case study is more likely to show us the scope conditions of my theoretical model. What I have found after examining the first child in civil war under the Tombal Bay regime from 1960 to 1975 is that by undermining both people's livelihoods and predominantly state capacity, capacity, the Sahel Road played a multiplier role in prolonging the ongoing civil war. The second Sudanese civil war, on the other hand, shows us that uh, persistent roads are not a, not a necessary cause of prolonged civil wars, 
a Sudan experienced short drought periods in a prolonged civil war. In the Sudanese case, the short drought periods were utilized as a weapon by the al-Bashir regime against the SPLA in the south by manipulating the famine conditions and international relief aid. The main factor explaining the prolongation of the Second Sudanese Civil War was related to the power struggle to control nature, natural resources between Khartoum and the SPLA. I mean the oil reserves on the north-south border. Last but not least, the Ethiopian Civil War shows us why persistent droughts are not a sufficient cause of prolonged civil wars as it experienced a relatively short civil war despite having a persistent drought. Nevertheless, this case shows us the scope conditions of my theoretical model, as I said earlier. Unless rebel groups unite and coordinate their military operations against government forces in the early phase of civil wars, and unless warning parties receive external military and economic support, we can expect that persistent droughts could prolong the duration of civil wars. So what? In general, we can say that civil wars are more likely to end with government victories, but predominantly negotiated settlements in a shorter period when they experience persistent droughts simultaneously. The conditional factors significantly interacting with persistent droughts are the weight of agricultural sector in the economic structure and the number of active rebel groups in an ongoing civil war. However, I, I found no significant impact of political exclusion and economic discrimination on the duration and outcome of civil wars. Although the magnitude of their impacts is low compared to the other factors, their statistically significant impacts suggest that there are reliable causal linkages underpinning the relationship between droughts and civil war durations and outcomes. Even though the impact of droughts seems to have a small effect on civil war dynamics, Droughts may reduce an ongoing civil war by a non-negligible period of time, which, though small in the broader length of a civil war, could lead to thousands of lives being saved, if not more. Uh, in summary, persistent droughts shorten the time required for government victories and predominantly negotiated settlements. This occurs through two interrelated causal mechanisms, the loss of livelihoods, but predominantly the decreased state capacity to provide basic needs to people occupying the rotted areas and to maintain counterinsurgency operations against rebel groups. It is important to note that droughts, neither necessary, droughts are neither necessary nor sufficient conditions for prolonged civil wars. Persistent droughts can only extend the duration of civil wars unless rebel groups are united or coordinated with their activities against central governments in the early phase of civil wars, or unless one of the warring parties, mainly governments, as external, external financial or military support. On the other hand, if a country experiencing civil war has exploitable natural resources, such as Sudan, the war is more likely to be prolonged, irrespective of the roads. In such civil war, in such civil war cases, governments utilize the roads as part of their counterinsurgency operations against rebel groups by manipulating international relief aid and recruiting pro-government militias under famine conditions through economic in incentives and rewards. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'm done. Wonderful. Thank you, Eunice. All right. Uh, I'm going to now play the presentation by Paria Mamsani and Hossein Farzin. Uh, they, because of their connection, have created a video presentation, which I will uh, now bring up and share on my screen. Uh, one moment, please. Can everybody see the presentation? Somebody give me a thumbs up. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Hossein Farzin. I'm here today with my colleague, Paria, who present our recent research on representation by media, the software utilization in Afghanistan, Iran, water diplomacy. This research is the result of the efforts of our team at Darbia Conaris University, Department of Water Engineering and Management. A great for
school of quantum. I want to ask you a short question. Think about this for a few seconds. What comes to mind when you think of the media rule in water diplomacy? Maybe you say information, a tool of power in hands of government or political group, challenging titles for more visit, answers. With that is mine, let us now explore multi-faceted nature of the media in the region. In a comprehensive definition, media is a communication tool that can convey a message to the audience with through social and political influence. Media has five main functions. Information, evaluating, public surveillance, political mobilization, and legitimization. And media is commonly influences through the reaction of the audience to the, to the specific subject with framing, agenda-saving, and planning. And now let's go back to the first question and discuss in more detail the role of the media in water diplomacy. Uh, just like the rule of water in the relations between countries, the media also seems to have both positive and negative rules. Uh, the positive roles that the media can play in this regard include environmental peace building, from crop diplomacy to network diplomacy, platform for communication, increasing water literacy, and informing the realities. However, the media can also appear in a negative role in creating conflict or representing reality. Negative roles include uh, representing of reality, reality uh, explaining misinformation on transparent water, secretization of water issues, um, building on um, self interest narrative, and uh, impacting the trust between actors. Our focus in this research is on the power of the media representation. Representation is a non physical form of power that is exerted through language and speakers' narrative of reality. And the representational force emphasizes the social construction of reality. Reality is a category that is not necessarily formed based on facts, but uh, rather in um, intertwined relationship uh, between an uh, objective fact and mental interpretations of them which affect behavior and interaction uh, within and between societies. Uh, representation is a wider part of the process which meaning is produced and exists among a member of culture. Now, Paria will tell us more about this. Hi, everyone. Regarding what my colleague Hossein presented, in this research, we try to answer the question, how do Afghan news agencies reflect the realities of transboundary water issues between Afghanistan and Iran? Since newspapers constitute valuable data repository and reflect the sociocultural perspectives and cognitive frameworks of communities, in this research, five news agencies were selected and reviewed in consultation with environmental and water elites. Then using these keywords, the available news articles were reviewed and a total of 316 news articles were collected. Irrelevant and repetitive news as well as news articles lacking the requisite information were eliminated. Subsequently, 156 news articles were retained for the final analysis. By analyzing the content of selected news articles, we identified these three dominant narratives which will be discussed one by one. The first narrative, which is hydraulic infrastructure as silver bullet, legitimizes the development of hydro infrastructures as necessary for solving the domestic issues of Afghanistan. For instance, dam construction or transboundary rivers is anticipated to yield multiple domestic benefits including economic development, self-sufficiency, job creation, and poverty mitigation. While these developments may temporarily improve the country's economic conditions, they hinder the long-term sustainability of the entire basin. For example, the construction of the Kamal Khan Dam has increased the area under cultivation, 
but jeopardize the sustainability of the Hamun wetlands, which will be discussed later. The second narrative is that Iran is to be blamed for environmental degradation. This narrative seeks to blame Iran for the dryness of international Hamun wetlands. News articles concerning Chahine artificial reservoirs here in the picture allege that Iran is responsible for the dryness of international Hamun wetlands. However, the actual capacity of Chahine is around 800 million cubic meters, while the Hamun wetlands require over 4 billion cubic meters to sustain ecological integrity. Furthermore, the 1973 treaty exclusively addresses drinking and irrigation needs, neglecting the environmental needs of the Hamun wetlands. The last narrative is the representation of Afghanistan Water Corporation with Iran. This narrative centers on water cooperation with Iran and the implementation of the 1972 treaty. In this narrative, Afghan news agencies see, seek to show that the development of hydraulic infrastructures would benefit Iran as well. For instance, the Kamal Khan Dam is largely cited as a project with the benefits of regulation of water supply and flood management. The Kamal Khan Dam has a spillway in the east-west direction which directs the diverted water towards the Qala Afzal Dam. The Qala Afzal Dam further diverts the Helmand River water to flow in an artificial north-south pass towards Godzara Depression. The diversion of water has resulted in the deprivation uh, of Hamun International wetlands, as you can see in the picture. Uh, followed by increased dust storms events and worsening health concerns and overall living conditions for residents of both Iran and Afghanistan. Regarding the results, we can conclude that by representing the realities of the basin, the Afghan news agencies has only narrated parts of the issues. This has caused an incomplete and one-sided understanding of the water-related issues with Iran. The represented narratives focus on specific parts of reality. This negatively influences the resonance of discourses and thus escalates tensions and hinder water cooperation. For water cooperation in the direction of sustainable development and integrated management of water resources, the media of riparian countries should avoid representing one-sided narratives and try to strengthen the common narratives and discourses. Thanks for your time and attention. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Hussein and Paria. And of course, Hussein and Paria are with us today. So uh, for the audience, please feel free to ask questions for their presentation. Uh, lastly, I'd like to uh, ask Rajat Manerji uh, to take over and present his uh, talk about adapt, adopting a grassroots participation model to address transboundary river water disputes. Uh, go ahead, Rajat. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone, one and all present here. Good evening, the respected chair, the esteemed panelists, and the learned audience. Uh, good afternoon and good morning if somebody is uh, representing from a different part of the globe. Uh, it has been a pleasure. Uh, to be here. And uh, shall I start with the PowerPoint presentation? Yes, please. Is it is it visible? It is visible if you could just maximize it. Oh. There's a, I think a, uh, a little icon in the bottom uh, of your screen, right beside the slide there. That little screen to the little bit to the right. Mm, uh, I am oh, unable to do it. I'm trying actually. Uh, no, no matter whatsoever, uh, I, I am uh, happy even without a PowerPoint presentation. So, so shall oh, I? Okay. We can see it. If you want to just advance it like that, that's perfectly fine. 
Yeah, that were uh, actually, uh, please move this window away. This this window away? Yeah, just try clicking on the main slide and see if that does it. Please move this window away from the shared application. Um, if you like, I can upload your presentation. I have it here as well. Yeah, yeah, it would be great, actually. Okay, one second. Um, if you could just um, stop sharing screen, please. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing the screen on my behalf. Uh, so uh, the, the, the topic, uh, it's... yeah, it's fine, sir. Okay. The topic for today's discussion is adopting a grassroots participatory model to address transborder river disputes, taking cue from the failed Indo-Bangladesh Tista Agreement. So to begin with, uh, let us allow me to uh, first start with uh, my own small experience uh, in, in, the, in the small state of West Bengal, where I belong from. Uh, a couple of years back, uh, I was uh, for the purposes of research, for the purposes of a, an empirical survey, I had been uh, to, a, to a village about 100, 100 kilometers away from, uh, from the city of Calcutta. And uh, uh, to my observation, uh, to my stark observation rather, I had found that, uh, that there is a severe dearth of uh, drinking water and any form of fresh water in the village. And uh, women folk back then had to travel miles together to fetch water in the, in the, in the respective pots. And uh, that was possibly the first inflection point uh, that, that actually drew me towards uh, working on, uh, on uh, something closer to uh, water policy and water diplomacy and water management in general. Now, having said that, uh, shall we uh, move to the second slide? Yeah, so uh, let us, uh, th there are certain hard facts. Uh, in fact, the, the 2023 water conference uh, spearheaded by the UN, the vision statement, makes it amply clear that we are we are at a very the world is at a very critical stage and uh, water even though it is abundant it is a scarce resource so it, it says that about two billion people uh, which is uh, which is a little less than one third of the of the total world population they are exposed to uh, uh, their uh, unsafe drinking water and many of them, quite a few uh, actually, are, are, do not have sufficient sanitation facilities, do not have, uh, they, so uh, the, the, report, the report, the observations of the report are, are testimony to the fact that we are uh, in the face of a severe water crisis. And uh, certain other facts are we have uh, many transborder, transboundary or transborder rivers to share and about 260 to be precise, and about 450 aquifers, if I may uh, quote uh, Mohammed Hussein et al, 2023. And uh, there was, so, and uh, I must also uh, make reference to the observations of Kofi Annan back in 2001, uh, when he had said that uh, fierce competition for fresh water may well become a, a, a source of conflict and worse in the future. So we, time is possibly has come wherein water will de decide the fate of governments and the governments may be toppled on the basis of, of the way it handles water, including fresh water, more so edible water. Uh, and uh, up, up, up there, a bit more into the facts, uh, unfortunately, in among the 153 countries that share transboundary water bodies, such as rivers, especially rivers, some aquifers and lakes also, uh, we only have a very miniature number, uh, the, about roughly about 32. Uh, this is as per the UN report, 2000 UN Water Report, 2021. So we roughly about a very miniature uh, number of countries having uh, having uh, 
some form of agreement or some form of uh, uh, bilateral uh, dialogue uh, with the with the other riparian state uh, uh, can we go to the next slide please and uh, we we if you continue uh, with with the problems uh, so the problems are immense and despite we have the fact that we have the we have two conventions the two two special laws that are made however it seems that the laws are uh, are still not uh, are not uh, potent enough to uh, protect uh, the, the the misuse of water resources include uh, uh, mainly caused uh, because of anthropologic reasons uh, may, may we proceed to the next slide yeah no, now uh, having having looked into the facts we, we let us come to the research problems the 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 main issues that circumscribe water so we already have the we have the goal uh, six of the Sustainable Development Goals, which bequeaths an obligation on the nation states uh, to to adopt uh, to adopt an, uh, a very integrated water resource uh, a strong water resource policy. However, uh, it, it it remains to be seen whether many of the nations so quite a, quite a few nations fight among themselves are in conflict passively or actively uh, with reference to the sharing of trans border uh, water resources. And uh, there, there is an increasing amount of tension we just saw between India and China the, before some time, and between India and Bangladesh, it has been going for years together, uh, and uh, between to, to an extent, uh, and uh, even the, the the other nations which the uh, uh, honourable speakers had just mentioned, they are also testimony as to the hard pressed problems and the ineffectiveness of the laws. To address the inter, uh, inter uh, regional or rather the interboundary water disputes, uh, shall we proceed so uh, to the argument? So the the main argument uh, of of uh, in this uh, in this lively session today is that the main arguments rather that uh, we we the, thus far we have been adopting a, a top down approach wherein the heads of the states used to send their uh, plenipotentiaries and the diplomats to uh, to uh, to uh, negotiate and to uh, come on with peace treaties but here my contention uh, in fact there, there there are quite a few authors who have said that uh, you must one must involve the, the 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 in a bilateral dialogue one must involve the grassroots community because the grassroots community are exactly aware of the of the kind of resources that are available and they are the they are the ones who are the ones who can effectively govern and manage the water bodies, especially the rivers. And the traditional bilateral diplomatic method is seemingly inept. These are the two arguments on which I am, the paper is still in the making. Uh, and uh, this, these are the two arguments of this paper. Please, uh, for the next slide, please. Now the now having uh, now we, we come to this is the river Tista, courtesy Jodip. Uh, who has clicked this beautiful picture of River Tista, starting from the from the Valley of Tibet, flowing through Sikkim, then West Bengal, and finally uh, flowing through Bangladesh and uh, ending up in the in the uh, in the Bay of Bengal. Now, this this river has been a bone of contention for since the formation of the Bangladesh back in the year, the year 1972 until thus far. No uh, no specific uh, uh, agreement has been reached. Uh, to by the respective heads of the uh, states. So shall we proceed to the next slide? If you may. Yeah, the mango diplomacy now. Uh, the last two years, we have seen both the heads of the states, our Honorable Prime Minister and the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, sh sharing and exchanging mangoes. Mangoes has been a method of diplomacy in, the, in this part of the world, especially in the global south. It has been a part. However, the man, even the mango diplomacy has failed mainly because it were you know, just only sharing of mangoes and sharing of uh, and 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 saying some words of the cooperation and sustained dialogue would not uh, would not be sufficient. It would be bereft of the observations of the st actual stakeholders. That is the people living on the banks of the Tista River. And there are there are millions of people across, starting from Tibet to Sikkim to West Bengal to Bangladesh, through, and it seems that uh, the the 
the absolute uh, Riverian integrity doctrine is has supposedly failed. So there's a lot of misuse of Tista water. That it has lost its uh, its uh, its uh, uh, its uh, uh, sanctity in a way, and uh, the the major reason being in the diplomatic process, which has been uh, going on since the last couple of years. Uh, there was uh, uh, the 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 heads of the government and the plenipotentiaries, the diplomatic corps, did not pay heed to the to the plight of the actual stakeholders, that is the people living in the banks of the Tista River. May, may we may proceed? And now, now it is uh, having the way forward. Now it, it's it's not. Of course, it's not so. Uh, so we we are looking at uh, an inverted uh, diplomatic approach, which the heads would not. Uh, it would not go down well with the heads of the government, because then you are actually percolating your decisions down to the grassroots. However. We we are we we stand in a very critical zone where vis a vis water, vis a vis the management and the governance of water. So, well, I I believe as an author and as a, a as a social uh, individual that we must embrace a grassroots public democracy framework, move away from the bilateral diplomacy framework which we have been adopting. Maybe the bilateral diplomatic framework may may give uh, may give a lot of sense may make a lot of sense for other maneuvers, but not for promoting water management or not for uh, engaging water dialogues. So this is one and second uh, way forward is that I would uh, say that we, uh, of course imparting a training to the key stakeholders because actually many of the people who are there in the grassroots they do not even know what the heads of their governments are going to do. So dams have been constructed without their primary information. Dams have been constructed without uh, environmental impact assessment being done uh, or even health impact assessment being done. And uh, so the imparting training is absolutely essential and conducting awareness generation programs, both nationally, regionally, and internationally. So the, here the international actors uh, may chip in as well as it is a national obligation to conduct awareness generation programs actually uh, and this way we may actually uh, we may ensure that goal 6b of the sustainable development goals which reads support and strengthen the participation of local communities in improving water and sanitation management so we have the, the the goal is very very clear so the goal says that come on you abjure your formal ways of diplomacy give it to the give it to the people give it to those who are the takers who are the who are actually bearing the brunt of of the climate change and any form of biodiversity loss and i believe goal 6b of the sdg is at par and must be protected must be respected thank you so much for uh, for hearing me through for this in this presentation thank you thank you very much rajat uh, very interesting uh, presentation uh, let me just stop the share here and uh, we now are at the point where we can open it up to question and answer. We have a number of people who have already put qu uh, questions in the Q&A uh, box. So please uh, make your way there. If you would like to ask your question uh, by voice, uh, please raise your hand as well. And I'll try to keep an eye on that. Um, our first question comes from Larry Swatuk, and it's for Paria and Hussein. Uh, and he asks why only Afghan newspapers were searched in your analysis and is it not important to compare upstream and downstream views um i wonder if hossein and power if you could answer uh, larry's question thank you uh, should i answer the question now yes please Do go you ahead have my voice Yes. Uh, for the first question, uh, dear Larry, thanks for your good question. Uh, I should mention that um, uh, what uh, we presented uh, we presented today was part of a big project, and we only presented uh, one part of our results. Uh, however, it's obvious that uh, some of Iranian news agencies have their one-sided point of view about the water, water issues between Afghanistan and Iran. Uh, 
But what is important here uh, is that to help maintain uh, peace in the region, uh, the existence of a common narrative is necessary. Uh, and reaching there, um, I think, is one of the challenges that uh, these two countries are facing today. I hope I can answer your question. Thank you, Paria. Uh, we have another question online uh, from an anonymous, anonymous attendee. Thank you so much for your presentation on Iran Afghanistan. How can international actors help to strengthen common narratives and cooperation between countries in order to help maintain peace and security while countries work to address and resolve such issues? That's for Paria and Hossein as well. Uh, thanks again for your question. Uh, in this regard, or I should say that in the Iran and Afghanistan case, usually international actors have acted according to their own interests, and uh, there are very few cases of water cooperation due to their uh, uh, role in the basin. However, international actors in the role of uh, um, international institute uh, can work in the direction of cooperation by maybe holding joint meetings and uh, increasing the capacity of cooperation between Iran and Afghanistan. And uh, currently we have a network between Iran and Afghanistan uh, which is uh, held by uh, IHE Delft Institute. Uh, I hope this network could uh, improve our relation with Afghanistan. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Benham Andik, who raised his hand. Uh, Benham, if you...